Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Queen Bawazi and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at GLBTQ Legal Advocates and Defenders, also known as GLAD. With me today is Jansson Wu, the Executive Director at GLAD, and Rodrigo Heng, the Executive Director at National Center for Transgender Equality. I'm looking forward to this conversation between them as we check in on where we are at this point in 2021 after a very tough legislative session. But even with the awful attacks, primary towards the transgender people, the young people in particular, there are some positive spots too. And I know Jansson and Rodrigo will give us some hope for the next steps in achieving the freedom and rights equality for our LGBT community. However, before we kick off, here's some little housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recorded link to everyone that has signed up. Please use the chat line, the chat box and put in your name, your pronoun and the organization if that is applicable. I would also like to thank Bowie, our SEL interpreter, and we do have captioning, you just have to activate the button on your computer. With that, if you have any questions during this session, drop those in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as possible as time permits. So permit me to hand this over to Jansson to start off the conversation. Thank you so much, Quinn. And thank you to all of you who are joining with us today, whether you're a GLAD supporter or a supporter of National Center for Transgender, Transgender and Quality, or you're entirely new to our organization, welcome. Um, I am Jansen Wu, the Executive Director of GLAD, and I am just so excited to be sharing this Justice Hangout with a good friend and a good colleague, uh, Rod Rod Rodrigo Hang Leitinen. Um, Rodrigo is the executive director of NCTE for the last 48 hours. Uh, we are so excited for Rodrigo's new leadership, uh, a critical partner on trans rights in our movement. Um, and I, you know, Rodrigo has worked in many other movement organizations before NCTE, including Freedom for All Americans, uh, Double A Glad, different from our Glad, which is Single A Glad the Transgender Law Center, Gender Justice LA, and the National LGBTQ Task Force. Um, but I had the real pleasure to work with Rodrigo on the campaign from 2016 to 2018, where we uh, fought uh, to include transgender new, um, um, folks in New Hampshire within their anti-discrimination protections. And we were successful in passing transgender non-discrimination protections uh, in a state that was entirely controlled uh, by Republicans, um, Republican governor, as well as um, uh, state Senate and state legislature and state house. And so we just learned so many valuable lessons for our movement of how to make equality and fairness for all people, but particularly for transgender people, uh, a, a value that we can all support. Um, so thank you so much and welcome Rodrigo. And before we get to our first topic, which is around um, the state legislative session that we are now finishing. I just want to give you an opportunity just to say hello, um, welcome, and introduce yourself as well. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome, Jansen, and thank all of you for joining us today. This is really exciting. Uh, so again, my name is Rodrigo, or Rigo for short, he, him pronouns. Uh, and as Jansen said, I'm the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality though that's new. I, I just started very recently as executive director and really honored to be with you all today in that new capacity. Um, yeah, Jansen and I worked together for so long and I see I see some folks um, in the attendee list uh, who are come joining us today who are Granite Staters who were part of that campaign. So particularly excited to be seeing you all again. Um, and uh, well, yeah, with that Jansen, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, so we're gonna, this is gonna be a conversation. We're just gonna shoot the breeze um, and kind of talk about where we've been in the last year and where we are currently and what's on the horizon. And so we want to start off with something that's really on the top of people's minds um, and top of people's concerns, which is the, I think now over 200 bills in state legislatures across the nation targeting LGBTQ people, but particularly targeting transgender people and youth. 
Um, this is really one of the you know, most concerning onslaughts that we've seen in recent history in our movement. And I'll also say that I personally have been so inspired by the amazing activism and advocacy that's been happening on the ground in all of these states. But Rigo, you've had like a ground view of the work that's happening there. So why don't you, you know, tell us what you've, what you've, what you're seeing, what is concerning, what has been inspiring? Absolutely. Well, the scope of this has been truly astounding. Um, we all know that, unfortunately, we face anti-LGBTQ attacks in state legislatures all the time. But this year was truly unprecedented in the fervor of those attacks, how many of them we faced, and especially that most of them were squarely targeted against transgender youth. I mean, that is narrow and it is not a coincidence. The opposition purposefully went after young trans people in order to use the most vulnerable amongst us as some kind of wedge issue. Uh, we had politicians using vulnerable trans youth as political footballs to try to score points. I wanna amplify something that Jansen said, these numbers, because I think they're so large that it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. Over 200 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced in over 30 states. That is over half of the nation faced some kind of anti-LGBTQ bill. In a lot of cases, they faced multiple, multiple versions of different kinds of attacks, uh, again, especially on trans youth. We really saw two bills over and over again. The first were sports bans. So these were bills that attempted to make it outright illegal for a transgender young person to play school sports. Now, the, these are sometimes disguised as, um, well, they're, they're always disguised as being about fairness, but really they're about singling trans students out. Um, and we know that that really subjects trans youth to more bullying. It puts a target on their back and sends the message that there's something wrong with being trans. Um, it makes these young people so much more vulnerable to bullying and harassment by their peers, by their friends, and even by their teachers and school administrators. So it kind of, these bills, um, they're wrong in so many ways. And one of them is that they kind of set a tone that somehow it's okay to attack these students who are just trying to play a school activity with their friends like any other kid. And you learn These... so many valuable life lessons through sports. I mean, you learn about teamwork and discipline and camaraderie. And so it's not just about like winning the game, it's about learning valuable life lessons. Absolutely. And it's such a, a important thing to remember that these are not, we're not talking about professional athletics with, we're not talking about MBA contracts with, um, we're talking about a ninth grader who wants to play volleyball with her friends. I mean, these are everyday activities that every young person is supposed to be able to engage in. Eight of these did actually pass. So, you know, we were able to beat a lot of them back, but in eight states, we did lose. In eight states, these sport, a sports ban was actually signed into law. That includes Florida, my home state, this was the first anti-LGBTQ bill to become law in over 20 years, which is just really, um, really speaks to the kind of moment that we're in. These bills also passed in Alabama, West Virginia, Montana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, South Dakota. I mean, this is all over the country. Um, the other kind of bill that the second of the two that we saw the most of were attacks on youth health care. So these were bills that sought to criminalize young people just accessing transition-related health care of any kind. In some cases, this even included mental health care. So even just being able to talk to a school counselor or talk to a therapist. Um, and potentially this could even extend to a situation where a young person is talking to a counselor, confiding in them, they're not there accessing services because they're trans, 
but the fact that they are trans or the fact that they are questioning their gender just comes up, and now and now that's become criminalized because of these bans. Where, where um, have those passed so far? Yeah, great question. Well, these passed in two states in Arkansas, and remember they they also had a sports ban, and in Tennessee also had a sports ban. So in two of these states, we lost on both grounds, the healthcare and, and the sports. So and notably, this is about youth again. Oh, go ahead, Jansen. Oh, please finish your thought and then I'm gonna jump in. Sure. Then notably, this is about trans youth. Again, these, these healthcare bans are squarely focused on young people. In some states, they define that as under 18 years old, in some states 16, in some states 21. So the particulars do vary. But the overarching theme was about singling trans youth out and the government categorically banning an entire kind of healthcare. Um, and remember, this is healthcare that the medical, American Medical Association recognizes as best practice healthcare. This is typical healthcare that all medical experts agree is essential primary care. And now the state governments are trying to take it completely off the table for an entire category of people. Yeah, it's, it's life changing, if not in many cases, some cases life saving medical care. And just thinking about a young trans person who's in the who's in under treatment right now and having that cut off in the middle is devastating. So um, so the impact and the harm is real. Um, my, I have two follow-up questions. One is, um, so we know the conservatives are using this as a wedge issue because it plays to their base. This is red meat to the base. But are these bills popular with kind of the general public? You know, it's such a good question. They're really not as popular <laughs> as you would think, considering how many politicians are pursuing them. Uh, politicians are doing this to, or the politicians who are doing it are doing it because they're trying to score points. They're trying to take a cheap shot. A lot of times they even know that it won't pass, but they are trying to kind of curry favor with a certain type of voter, especially to win their primary races. And I, it's really important to remember that because it speaks to how much this is just their selfishness and them trying to take advantage. They're not thinking about the effect on the actual young people and their families. It's really about them and their reelection prospects. Um, and they're not thinking about the real human beings who are hurt by these kinds of policies. But we see every day that more and more, more and more regular everyday Americans are recognizing that this is bullying. So we absolutely still have a lot of work to do to move public opinion along, but public opinion is more supportive and becoming stronger in our direction every day. It's the, these pol elite politicians who are holding us back the most. Yeah, no, no, it's such a good point. Um, and, you know, I, you mentioned Arkansas passing the medical ban and, you know, it was the governor of Arkansas actually vetoed this, right? And then the legislature overturned that veto and the governor's a, you know, conservative Republican still, right? So like, it seems like there is still opportunity to move and change hearts and minds. Am I being Pollyannish about this? Or, or, or is, there, is there opportunity here to convince people to do right? There is absolutely opportunity. I mean, we experienced that firsthand, Jansen, in the New Hampshire non-discrimination campaign. When that campaign started years before um, I was even involved, the, I, the kind of reaction was, there's no way this is possible. There's no way that this Republican legislature and Republican governor is going to sign, proactively sign this positive bill to protect transgender granted staters. But we pushed and we pushed and we got it done. And the, the reason why, and I think we have experienced that, all of us here in this webinar today have experienced that in some way in our lifetimes on LGBTQ rights. I mean, we've won things now that were unimaginable 10 years ago. So I think we're winning. And that is actually why the opposition is doing these trans youth attacks, because they know the writing is on the wall. They know that we're winning. They came after us on same-sex marriage and we won. They came after, us, uh, came after us on transgender bathroom bans and we won. Now they're coming after us on trans youth in sports and healthcare 
and we will win. It's on us to do the activism every day. Um, we can't take it for granted. It's on us to mobilize. But if we do it, we will win because we have been here before and we've done it before. And the last thing I'll say is that we do have some really great news out of New England specifically to that effect. So Jansen, um, how about you You fill us in on some of the, the good news? Uh, happy to. Um, so in New England, where GLAD works legislatively in the states, um, we are not immune to these attacks. So in four out of the six New England states, we saw anti sports bans um, introduced. And we are so excited that we were able to fend every single one of them off. We were most concerned about New Hampshire because New Hampshire's legislature was entirely Republican controlled and the governor was Republican. And um, this is the second time they've tried this bill. Um, and we know that the chair of the committee uh, that the bill is being heard in was actually a co-sponsor of the bill. So we were a little nervous about New Hampshire and I'll just point out one inspiring example of activism, um, which was um, uh, someone we actually helped uh, many years ago, Sarah Huckman, uh, who is a transgender um, young adult um, who grew up in New Hampshire, had always done cross country and cross country skiing. Um, and when she entered middle school, wanted to compete on the girls cross country team as the girl that she is. And the Interscholastic um, you know, Athletics Association had a policy that forbid transgender athletes like herself from participating in the team that, um, in that uh, aligns with, the gender, with their gender identity. And so you know, with GLAD support, Sarah actually advocated to get that policy change and was able to play um, with her um, other girlfriends on the cross country team. So that was many years ago. Fast forward now, and this is what always I love. She is an amazing, um, she's a college student at UNH and she's become this amazing uh, role model and advocate. And she came back to the state house to uh, testify against that anti-trans um, uh, sports ban in, this, in New Hampshire and was pivotal in helping us kill that bill despite the fact that it was Republican controlled. And so for anyone who wants to learn more about Sarah, um, she's actually featured in this incredible documentary that's on Hulu right now called Changing the Game. It features three amazing trans sports advocates who have had to fight for their um, ability to play sports and she is one of them. So definitely check it out. It will really inspire you and also uh, just fill you with such respect for these incredible young activists. Other you know, amazing victories we've had in New England, um, we were actually just able to completely modernize our parentage and family laws in Connecticut so that all families are recognized and respected regardless of whether the parents are married, regardless of whether or not the parent is um, genetically related with their children, regardless of how that child came into the world. All that matters is who's intended to be the parent and who is acting as the parent. And that is what the law now um, uses as its guide in Connecticut. We passed a similar law in Rhode Island last session. We are working to pass the similar Parentage Act in Massachusetts for all of you who are joining from Massachusetts, please contact your state legislatures um, and ask them to support the Massachusetts Parentage Act. There's so much more, but we're limited on time. So why don't we move on to our next topic? <laughs> sure, there is so much to cover. So I'll talk briefly about the, the federal side of all of this. Um, and I want to be mindful of time. The, I mean, the good thing is that there's so many wins federally, but I'm going to keep it short. Um, so obviously with this year, we've had not just finally a pro LGBT quality president again, but actually the most pro LGBT quality president we've literally ever had. So um, right at the gate, we've been able to score a lot of victories that are especially important um, when we're otherwise facing these other attacks. This really bolsters our support and lays a strong foundation from us, for us. This is everything from ending the trans military ban um, implementing Bostock now that I don't know if everyone knows Bostock is kind of a legal group so maybe you are but just in case this is a Supreme Court decision last summer uh, um, that uh, really clarified and set in stone that LGBT people have protections against discrimination and employment. But what's really new for this year is that the federal government has now expressed that that extends to a lot of other areas of the law. 
So now we've secured protections in housing, uh, secured protections in healthcare, um, in education. Um, so schools really know that they have to respect trans youth and that's gonna be especially valuable for fighting the youth sports bans in those eight states that passed them. Um, the federal government is also weighing in against these state attacks. Um, and the, the newest initiative was about passports. Um, that's a really important identity document for a lot of us. And now the federal government has announced that they will add the X gender marker. So a third gender marker, an alternative to the male and female mm -hmm. ones. And really significantly, they're dropping the medical requirements for updating the M or the F or the X for that matter. Um, so if you are transgender like me and that passport was a holdout for you, if you could not update it because of the medical requirements, good news, you're, you're not gonna be, be facing that much longer. So I really encourage you if you are trans or you know someone who is, who has not yet updated those documents, um, look into it. And even if you don't have a passport, you can apply for a new one in your authentic gender, even if your driver's license or state ID says the wrong gender, you can get a passport that reflects who you really are. So really encourage you to check that out. And you can go to NCT's website, transequality.org. We have a guide to help you through that. And Jansen, you wanna talk about the court cases? Absolutely. Um, so before I do that, we got a really excellent question about litigation challenging some any bad laws that pass at the state level. And I am so, uh, remiss in not mentioning the fact that GLAD just filed one of those pieces of litigation. So just uh, this week, we filed a lawsuit challenging a law that was enacted in Tennessee um, that would require businesses that are actually doing the right thing, allowing trans people to use the appropriate restrooms. It would require those businesses to put up a really demeaning sign that basically puts the public on quote alert that transgender people are using the appropriate restroom. And it, what it effectively does is it forces businesses to put a you are not welcome sign up for transgender um, patrons and also put those transgender people at risk of harassment and violence inside those restroom facilities. So this, we had hoped that we had moved past the restroom uh, wedge issue, um, but it seems to still have a little bit of steam. And so we need to, really um, counter that forcefully. And so GLAD was proud to partner with um, um, National Center for Lesbian Rights in filing this litigation against the Tennessee law. There's also amazing litigation that's been filed by our um, uh, colleagues at Lambda Legal and ACLU challenging sports bans in Georgia, Tennessee, Idaho, and medical bans in other states as well too. Um, so yes, the federal courts have an important role to play in defeating some of these horrible laws. Um, going back to the US Supreme Court though, and I know um, we've talked about this actually, at least you know, to our GLAD membership a lot, so I'm gonna be really brief, but we had a big case decided just a few weeks ago. The case was Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. And this is a case where the City of Philadelphia contracts, contracts with agencies to provide child um, foster ch um, um, placement services. And one of the agencies that they contracted with was Catholic Social Services, which refused to comply with Philadelphia's non-discrimination provisions as it relates to sexual orientation, and gender identity, and thereby refused to place children with LGBT parents. Um, when the city of Philadelphia um, refused to renew that contract, some Catholic Social Services sued, and that went up to the US Supreme Court, which just decided a few weeks ago in favor of Catholic social services. And so that of course is concerning because we know that this is one of the strategies of our opponents because they know they're gonna lose on the non-discrimination issue, you know, eventually because 70% of Americans support fairness for LGBTQ people. And so they're shifting the conversation to make it about religious exemptions. And this is one of their strategies is through the courts. And so they're trying to chip away holes at these protections that we already have in order to not have to comply with the same laws everyone does. That said, even though the Supreme Court ruled for Catholic social services, they did so in a really narrow way that was really specific to the facts of the case. And that would not be applicable to other situations, other state contracts, other agencies, and 
you know, thankfully not other state non-discrimination laws. Um, so that was a relief, but it's not the end of the story. And we know that uh, our opponents already have other religious quote unquote freedom cases in the pipeline um, ready to bring to the US Supreme Court. We know at least three justices are, are already signaled that they are willing to um, elevate religious freedom over non-discrimination protections. Um, and we have two justices who are on defense, that's Coney Barrett as well as Kavanaugh. Um, and so it's precarious, it is precarious right now. Thankfully, one of those cases in the pipeline um, was just rejected for review by the US Supreme Court. And that was a case in Arlene Flowers, where, you know, you can remember the Masterpiece Cake Shop case again. This is Masterpiece Cake Shop 2.0, but with better facts, I guess. And so this is a florist that didn't want to provide services to a couple to celebrate their, um, their wedding, a same-sex couple to celebrate their wedding. And that was pending at the Supreme Court for two years. And finally, the court said, we're not going to hear this case. So that, thankfully, is um, is gone. But there are other cases as well, too, in the pipeline that we're watching. Lastly, I just want to celebrate one huge victory for, speaking of trans youth activists, um, Gavin Grimm has been a hero to our movement for so many years. Gavin was a high school student in Virginia who was not allowed to use the appropriate restroom that aligned with his gender identity. He bravely sued for his rights. That went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a little complicated. It came back down to the district court and then it went back up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear his case, which is a great result because that means that the appellate court decision below at the Fourth Circuit stands. And that decision was a victory for Gavin and trans youth all over the country because it affirmed the right of transgender students to be able to use the appropriate restrooms under, under Title IX. So we've been talking, I know we're at 1230, we're gonna go just a little bit over time because I think um, the last topic is so important. Um, and the window of opportunities now that we wanna make sure that everybody hears about this. So we've been talking a lot about the courts, about Bostic and how it expanded anti-discrimination protections to LGBTQ workers. But all of this could be solved with one piece of legislation, one piece of legislation that is pending in front of the Senate and that is the Equality Act. So Rodrigo, do you wanna talk a little bit about why the Equality Act is a priority for NCTE? Sure, well, the Equality Act would codify and establish our non-discrimination protections in virtually every aspect of daily life. You know, we're, if we're able to win these court cases and other things, we'll plug some of the gaps, but there are still some things that we just need the Equality Act to fix. Um, so, you know, what we mean by non-discrimination protections in daily life are things like public spaces or, you know, right now it's illegal for someone to discriminate against you on the bus, but not in an Uber or a Lyft. I mean, that's what we're talking about gaps. There's just all these parts of when you go out in the world, when you go anywhere other than work, school, or place of worship, where it, People should not be able to discriminate against you, and that's what the Equality Act would establish. Um, again, it's sitting with the Senate, so all of you should contact your senators. We really urge you to contact your senator, and do not take your senator's support for granted. You know, maybe you live in a state where you think, ah, nah, my senator's fine on this. They still need to hear from you, and you know why? Because our opposition is calling them. Our, our senators, including the ones who are supportive, are still getting phone calls from their constituents against the Equality Act. So they need to hear from you too, that you're for it, that you live in their state and you are, you are expecting them to support the Equality Act. And then once you do that, once you've called your Senator, get your friends to call as well. Um, especially if you have friends who live in other states, we really need a growing chorus of support for these really critical protections. Um, and you can find out who your senator is and do all of this at passtheequalityact.org. So again, that's passtheequalityact.org. Super simple. You can look up your look up your senator and get their phone numbers, call, email, tweet, everything. Your senators need to hear from you. And I would just add, thank you, um, Rigo. I would just add that the Equality Act does so much more 
um, than just anti-LGBTQ protections. Um, it also expands protections in public spaces um, for uh, racial minorities. It expands protections for um, woman identified folks uh, in public spaces and in federal funded programs. Um, so this is really a broad bill. And I'll also say um, from a racial justice perspective, the number one issue that we hear from LGBTQ folks of color of the challenges they face is getting a job. It is about employment, it is about housing. And so the folks who would be most benefited by having these secure protections in place are the folks who, um, LGBTQ folks of color, particularly trans people of color. And so this is so important for our entire community and beyond. So thank you to everybody for calling your senators and I, for getting engaged. Our window of opportunity is like the next six to eight weeks. So let's make sure our voices are heard because our opposition is certainly making their voices heard. So it's time to make sure that we are meeting that call just as loudly, if not louder. With that, thank you all so much. I'm gonna pass it back to Quinn to close this up. Thank you, Jensen and Rodrigo. Thank you for sharing that very important information. Uh, you can learn more about GLAD and the work that NCTE does by visiting www.glad.org and www.transequality.org. And just as Jensen and Rodrigo have said, please do visit pastorequalityact.org and engage your senators and also learn how to get involved more. And with that, Please follow us on our Facebook, IG, Twitter, and learn more about all the work that we do. Thank you all so much for showing up and enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>